welcome everyone. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, appreciate people turning out despite the time change for which, uh, for which we apologize. Um, it's uh, really, um, well actually I should say who I am first. I'm Matthew Goodman, uh, Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Uh, and I am just delighted to have Undersecretary Lael Brainerd with us uh, here today, uh, back at CSAF. Um, she's a familiar guest, I think, here, and obviously familiar to all of you. Um, Lael is uh, Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, as I think you all know. I hope you have bios. Um, uh, she's in a position that in which I have been uh, in awe since I was a young whippersnapper at Treasury 25 years ago, and so it's a real honor to be up here on the stage with her. Um, uh, Lael has a distinguished uh, career in academia and in government service, uh, having served, among other things, as Deputy National Security uh, Economic uh, Advisor in the Clinton administration, um, but also served uh, previously uh, in, in other uh, capacities. Um, she also uh, worked at another think tank up near DuPont Circle um, and, uh, and uh, both studied and taught at a number of uh, universities in uh, uh, distinguished universities in the uh, New England area, uh, particularly in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So uh, you can read all about that in the biography. Um, uh, we'll get uh, started in a second, but let me just sort of set the scene by saying that um, Lael's just off the plane, and not just any plane, uh, from Los Cabos, Mexico, where she had joined the president uh, at the seventh, I believe, if I counted correctly, mm. uh, leaders summit uh, under the, uh, uh, the sort of newly uh, revised uh, G20 format. Uh, Treasury's been working on the G20 for 15 years, but as a leaders forum, it's uh, been around only since the end of 2008. Um, and uh, they had the uh, seventh meeting, first one in Latin America um, in Los Cabos, Mexico on Monday and Tuesday. And um, we're going to hear about what was talked about there. But this is uh, the self-described premier forum for international economic coordination uh, in the world. It is obviously a uh, a uh, very important forum in which uh, major uh, issues of global uh, economic uh, growth and governance are discussed. And um, it is uh, uh, um, obviously very timely to have had this meeting uh, right now in the face of uh, the, the global economic situation, which is uh, something that I hope we're going to hear a little bit more about in a second. What I'll do is I'll ask uh, Lael a few uh, initial questions, and then I'll open it up uh, for uh, questions from the audience, and uh, I hope they are questions so that we can get as much time uh, from Lael as possible. So with that, uh, Lael, so let me start kind of with the basics. Summits are usually made up of two big parts. One is the actual discussions that happen in the plenary rooms and in the hallways, and the other is the outcomes, which are uh, generally reflected in the, in the communique. Um, so let me ask you about both of those. What happened down there? What was the major focus of discussion? Presume the Eurozone, but um, sort of can you give us some flavor of of how the discussions went down there. And then secondly, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has read all 85 paragraphs of the communique uh, thoroughly, but um, it is um, sometimes a little difficult to divine from that exactly what's important and what isn't important. So if you could highlight sort of three or four of the major takeaways sure. that we should, we should understand from, from the communique, that would be helpful. I'd be delighted to, and uh, thank you very much for hosting me. And, um, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Matthew was one of the stars of uh, the Treasury Department, uh, who is to this day uh, remembered fondly for his uh, service uh, back in uh, the late 90s and uh, going, I guess, into the early 2000s. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, let me say that uh, the discussions both in the room uh, the, uh, I think, text that you'll see in the outcomes document, and then the many sideline conversations, both formal and informal, that take place at those meetings, which, you know, in some regards are the most important parts of those meetings. I would say the preponderance uh, of the discussion was on um, the challenging um, economic uh, circumstances uh, surrounding uh, the meeting, uh, and in particular, on um, the uh, developments um, within uh, the Euro area. The um, discussions uh, in terms of the tone, I would say, uh, were very constructive. Uh, there was a lot of unity of purpose, um, very uh, sober. 
about the risks uh, facing uh, all of the largest economies, um, but again, uh, with a particular focus on the euro area. And uh, generally speaking, I think there was a, a broadly agreed sense of um, uh, what the risks were, and uh, there was a lot of interest in hearing from Euro area colleagues in particular about uh, where uh, they saw their crisis response uh, going uh, in uh, the days ahead. At the same time, while I think there was a lot of discussion, uh, a lot of very good indications of what kinds of issues are being intensively discussed among Euro area and European colleagues, there was also a broad recognition uh, that we had only four, the largest four, but nonetheless four of the 17 Euro area members there, five of the 27 uh, EU members there, and that the real decision-making uh, uh, discussion uh, would not be until uh, the European Council meetings at the end of the month. So while I think there was a lot of interest in where the discussions among the Euro area leaders and European leaders more broadly are going, there was a recognition that no decisions would be taken uh, with regard to those issues uh, at the Los Cabos summit. Okay. And then in terms of sort of, can you, can you give us a flavor? I mean, again, there's a lot in the, in the communique, but which parts are, should we be most focused on? The, the discussion of the, the growth uh, imperative and what people are doing about growth? Is it the financial issues in Europe? Um, what, yeah. what aspects are most? Yeah, so I think um, what you'll see if you look at uh, the communique and the statements that uh, leaders were making in and around the summit as well, there is a, a pivot, a shift. There's more of a consistent uh, focus across countries. Uh, on the need to support demand at a time of weaker demand in many of uh, the largest economies. And um, that is a bit of a shift. Uh, as you'll recall, um, in Seoul, for instance, there was a more uh, consistent, um, and certainly also uh, earlier in Toronto, there was more of a sense that the recovery was, was kind of gathering steam. Uh, here, uh, there was a, a sort of broad recognition that uh, we all needed to be supporting demand in the short run. And of course, with some countries having more space than others to do that, um, there was a lot of interest, of course, uh, in some of the measures uh, that the largest emerging markets are taking, with China in particular, having a lot of space um, to shift its growth model from one that has traditionally been dependent on the largest economies, and in particular with its European export markets, um, much uh, less vibrant a focus on uh, China's measures to shift to domestic demand-led growth. I think a, an appreciation of some of the uh, measures they've taken to let their exchange rate move more freely, but also recognizing they have a lot of capacity to uh, support consumption, consumers, and social safety nets. Uh, some discussion about uh, how we are here in the U.S. managing that careful balance between uh, support for the economy, uh, support for job creation, which the President has been very, very focused on um, in the near term, especially uh, recognizing that it's important uh, as a bit of an insurance policy against shocks uh, emanating from abroad, but recognizing that that needs to go hand in hand with a balanced approach to um, getting our fiscal house in order on a, on, a, on a medium term path. And then, of course, the largest amount of focus and discussion was about um, European efforts and um, uh, proposals to move uh, the Euro area onto uh, a more resilient path. And I can, I can spend can, can a moment I, yeah, on you, that if that'd be your, helpful. In your and Secretary Geithner's both previews and, um, and readouts on the, on the summit, you, you focused, I think, on four basic areas um, in, in the Euro uh, situation. One was Greece, second was the idea of banking union, financial union, uh, third was financial backstops and say, uh, firewalls to help promote for reform and allow uh, the countries uh, that, that need to borrow to borrow. Um, and uh, at reasonable rates, and, and then supporting demand, which yeah. you've, you've just talked about. So um, let's just talk about Greece for a second. So you, I think, indicated in, in one of your preview uh, meetings, and it's 
hints of this have been elsewhere from the Germans and from others, the IMF and others, that there may be some flexibility in looking at the package that was provided to Greece um, earlier this year and maybe revisiting at least some of the timing. Is that something that's, that was actively discussed and that, that is in the uh, is, is there a prospect of that in order to help Greece get through the situation? Well, of course, you know, the, uh, the Greek election outcomes were uh, being read out just as leaders were getting off their uh, planes in Los Cabos. And, you know, now um, we have the, the formation of a new government, which was the critical missing element there for several months uh, in Greece. So I think now, um, you know, with a government having been formed, certainly, um, the uh, Euro area partners and the IMF have said they're going to go back uh, and sit down uh, with the new government um, to uh, work uh, towards a path of sustainability within the Euro area um, while maintaining the momentum for reforms. Those reforms, of course, are critically un important under any circumstances. Uh, Greece. Uh, it has a huge interest in regaining competitiveness and working to have a much more vibrant private sector. But Greece um, was off course for some period of time when there was, an, in effect, uh, no government able to continue uh, to move forward on some of uh, the reform uh, agenda and the timeline that had previously been laid out. So, you know, I think we certainly support the efforts of um, our Euro area partners, the IMF, uh, sitting down with uh, the new government of uh, Prime Minister Samaras. Uh, and, you know, we think there's recognition on both sides that it's, it's critically important to move forward uh, with reform um, within the Euro area. And it's also important to show some flexibility, again, recognizing that uh, the timing of the reforms were knocked off course. Uh, by that period in which they really did not have a government. Mm -hmm. And okay, on financial union, banking union, which is a European term for, for what may be the next sort of step in the European project, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about what that entails and, and, and why it's important and whether it's enough? I mean, is, that, is, the, is it the right next logical step? Is there another piece that's missing? Um, in order to, to make all of this work over the medium yeah. to long term. Let me answer the second question okay. first and then go to the specifics. So I think broadly speaking, um, you have to see these pieces as part of an integrated whole and that uh, the euro area is moving forward on a number of very closely interrelated parts. And I think it's also uh, very important to recognize um, that the discussions that are taking place are both about setting out a medium term framework for greater um, financial integration, greater uh, fiscal integration uh, that are going to be necessary uh, to complement uh, monetary integration. Um, but that medium-term framework, of course, needs to be complemented by near-term actions to, um, to really uh, stabilize financial markets and ensure that countries like Spain and Italy who are undertaking very serious, important, but challenging reforms uh, continue to be able to uh, borrow at sustainable rates. Within that, um, the uh, piece that is variously described as banking union and uh, financial union um, appears to be uh, being very um, deeply discussed now. Uh, our European partners gave us some sense of, of the discussions that they're having. And it's really a question of um, how much uh, integration to have, uh, how much to centralize to move things um, to the euro area level from the national level on banking supervision, um, uh, bank resolution, which goes hand in hand with recapitalization. Moving uh, to a more central level on supervision and resolution authority, of course, is going to be critically important and necessary precondition for being able to undertake uh, greater risk sharing, for instance, on um, deposit insurance and on recapitalization. So those conversations are um, underway. Uh, we got a flavor of them, um, you know, both in the room and in sideline conversations. You'll see that noted um, in the communique as a very important element. Um, and again, uh, we don't, uh, did not anticipate, uh, would not have expected to see actual policy decisions reached without the key decision makers of the euro area. And the complement to that in the near term, of course, is that um, Spain has announced it's moving forward with a 
you know, an ambitious plan to recapitalize its banking system will move uh, with forward with a request um, for European financing and Euro area partners have indicated that they are uh, ready to support that request. And you know, in the near term, of course, um, uh, going forward, it uh, will be important to see further clarification in terms of how Spain uh, plans to go forward in uh, cooperation with uh, its European partners. And so I think there'll be a lot of uh, interest in that. And, and on both the Spain situation and the sort of the broader financial union uh, details, as you mentioned, it's not appropriate to really lay all that out uh, in a forum which only has a, a subset of the members there. But uh, it seems, it feels as though reading the President's and uh, Secretary Geithner's comments in the wake of the, of the summit as though, uh, you know, and I think this has been commented on by some in the press, that there's a sort of a slightly greater sense that there is high expectation for that European summit next week um, in producing the details and the clarity that's required. Is there a concern that they're not going to produce uh, the, the plan um, or or uh, are we fairly confident we're going to get a, a, a good sense of the package and that that's going well, to be? Well, of course, I, you know, I, of course, we would not be in a position um, to prejudge uh, what will come out of those discussions. That is, you know, these are fundamental um, issues of institutional architecture and design that the euro area uh, will have to work out for itself. Um, what we did see, um, you know, in the room, in our bilateral conversations, in the conversations that the president had with the four uh, members of the Euro area um, and the EU that were present, the five members of the EU that were present. There'll be a test afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Who those members are. This is this is always my. Uh, I, I have memorized all of this now, but it keeps moving. Um, uh, the discussions there gave a very clear sense that these were kind of the key elements and these were the uh, clear directions of travel, um, but they're still uh, working to put flesh on the bones and, and that's an area where I think it's really, we'll see um, what more they come forward with at the end of the month and what their own timeline is for further decisions on that. Okay. Um, let me ask you two more things and then I'll, then I'll, um, I'll open it up, actually three. Um, two substantive, one, one process. Is there, is there anything more the U.S. can or should be doing beyond sort of the moral suasion, bringing our experience to the fore? I mean, you know, to put out one issue that some people have talked about, you know, should the U.S. be reconsidering its uh, contributions to the International Monetary Fund in some way to help support um, the, the situation in Europe and, for that matter, globally, uh, where there are risks, as you said, beyond Europe? Um, is there anything else we can or should be doing specifically? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we are deeply engaged um, with our European partners and with our international partners um, because Europe is very important to us. Um, Europe is a very large um, part of the world economy. Uh, it's a huge trade partner for us. Uh, Europe's uh, banks are global in their activities in many cases, and so. Um, Financial market volatility in Europe uh, is uh, seen in uh, sentiment here. Uh, when demand in Europe weakens, uh, that translates into lower exports and fewer jobs here. And of course, uh, Europe uh, is a vital uh, ally to the United States. So we are deeply engaged. Uh, Europe is very important to us, and the health of Europe is very important to us. Um, you know, we are. Uh, supportive of Europe in a whole variety of ways. Um, we welcome the commitments uh, at the IMF. Uh, as I think we were very clear, those are a, a very uh, welcome sign of solidarity. We don't actually think that the IMF is, at the end of the day, going to be uh, the central, uh, most important uh, element uh, for a monetary union uh, that has tremendous will and tremendous capacity and ultimately will have to address the features of its institutional architecture that are going to make it resilient and vibrant into the future. Um, but you know, for our part, we, uh, we, we, by the way, never have made uh, standalone bilateral loans to the IMF of this nature. We don't have the capacity um, uh, to do it the way most countries uh, do it. Uh, but we do already have uh, Fed swap lines uh, that are um, uh, supportive of uh, Europe and we'll continue to be as supportive as we can 
of Europe um, because, again, it's so vitally important to us recognizing that the uh, that the Euro area is going to be strong and vibrant primarily due to its own uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier the hopes and expectations and discussions about what China uh, and, and other uh, participants uh, in the, I mean, big players in the global economy could do to support growth. What, what about what China wants of Europe? I mean, was, were, were, were China or any of the other major emerging markets vocal participants in the discussion about Europe, or was this largely a conversation among the Europeans and between the U.S. and the Europeans? You know, there's, um, again, there's uh, at a summit of this nature, um, you know, and, and also re um, remembering that the summit itself is buttressed by a lot of activity, for instance, among finance ministers and central bank governors going into these summits. So there's a lot of uh, networks of officials talking to each other, uh, both going into and at the summit. And then even at the summit, you have the conversations in the large plenary room, and you have a lot of conversations on the side. So we don't know, of course, um, what some of the emerging markets said to their European partners uh, directly in some of the side conversations. But it's uh, certainly the case that in the room, um, you know, countries expressed uh, solidarity uh, with uh, European partners as they navigate through some challenging circumstances. A lot of countries in the room, of course, including our own, uh, has ample experience uh, with financial uh, crises of our own. And of course, this is true of many of the emerging markets, which they, uh, which they share. Uh, and of course, uh, there was a sentiment in the room of, uh, uh, urging uh, action and uh, standing behind the euro area as they move forward on those actions. Um, you know, separately we had conversations uh, with our uh, Chinese partners, both you know the um, uh, Secretary Geithner with Vice Premier Wang as uh, heads of the economic track and the strategic economic dialogue, and then of course President Obama and President who, you know, we continue to have very active uh, economic discussions between uh, China and the U.S. on what their plans are and, you know, again, uh, reassurance that they are moving forward to support their economies in ways that will shift that pattern of demand to greater uh, domestic consumption. Um, and uh, we always talk about our own um, uh, policy path. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we often talk together about how we view global developments and how we're prepared to work together to help support a stronger recovery globally. Great. Okay. One final question, sort of an institutional question. Uh, there's a small cottage industry of us uh, folks who follow the G20 and are interested in it as a as a uh, vehicle for global economic governance. So let me ask, from a Treasury perspective, has the uh, is the G20 still relevant, and is it a uh, because people are questioning whether whether it is and whether it, it it's valuable? And then this is a little trickier for a Treasury person to answer, but let me ask anyway. Yeah. Try. Um, was the elevation to leaders level, uh, you know, an important part of uh, uh, supporting what you do? And uh, you know, is leaders' participation uh, uh, essential to to continuing uh, to make progress on those kinds of issues you've been talking about? Yeah. So I think you know the reality is um, this is the right group of countries. Um, you know, the world has changed uh, irreversibly. And uh, we need uh, the large emerging markets in the room, uh, along with uh, the advanced uh, large economies, to uh, really drive decisions uh, and to move forward and to develop a shared sense of uh, what the challenges are and urge action on the part of the various um, uh, countries or regions that you know, have the ability to affect those outcomes. Um, the, advantage, of course, uh, for um, uh, finance ministers of having leaders there, uh, although, of course, um, they meet less frequently, and I think that's, that's also appropriate because it's a, it's a big commitment of their time, but that they really do drive uh, decisions to closure at a political level. And so I'll give you the one example that people don't really spend enough time uh, focusing on. I think everybody is aware of this group and the important role it played um, on coordinated response to the financial crisis and 
the important work uh, this group did in directing the development banks to put up $250 billion to raise another $750 billion in and through the IMF. Those were very significant. But the financial regulatory reform agenda has been um, critically, I think, underwritten by leader-level political commitments. I, I, I don't think we would be anywhere close to where we are today if those decisions had not been uh, driven by leaders, endorsed by leaders, and now owned by leaders to get through parliaments where necessary. And if you look at the Financial Stability Board, um, which is the uh, sort of um, financial supervisors, regulators, central bank governors, and treasuries uh, appendage <laughs> to some degree of the G20 process, but includes a larger number of, of jurisdictions, that group has benefited tremendously from getting political commitments on, for instance, um, OTC derivatives is a completely new area where we did not have uh, national standards uh, for regulation, let alone international standards. We're now working on, and I think we'll conclude on time, an agreement on, a global agreement on margins uh, for OTC derivatives, which you know is, is really quite remarkable. The other thing that people don't focus on in that context, uh, and it extends to resolution, uh, to bank capital, uh, to bank uh, um, deposit insurance. The other thing uh, that people haven't noticed is that in that context, both emerging markets and advanced economies have signed up to exactly the same set of standards. And people tend to overlook that. But it is quite a different approach than we've seen in a whole host of other fora. And I think, I think it, it is a, a notable achievement. And having leaders meet once a year and review where we are on implementation is a force in driving through uh, the legislation where we need it. So I, I think it, it's clunky. Uh, it's harder to coordinate with that many uh, countries. I think the G7 you know, remains relevant on the fastest crisis response issues of the day because it is hard to get all the G20 on the phone you know, within an hour's notice and get them all to agree on something. They're not accustomed to that. Many of the G20 members who are not G7 members, G7 members have developed over time a set of habits that, you know, it's very easy for them to get on the phone and make a decision to, you know, take a response on, make a statement uh, as they did uh, after the Greek elections. That'll take more time with the G20, but it's evolving, uh, I think, in a direction uh, that will allow it ultimately to, to become that. And, and really part of the point is actually to try to spread, you know, those habits of cooperation to a broader uh, group of countries, even though it is clunky, as you say. Um, and let me just also say on the financial, financial regulatory reform agenda, we had, um, as you probably know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a preview event here, including your right arm, uh, yes. Mark Sobel, <laughs> for these purposes, and, um, and Rupert Thorne, the number two at the Financial Stability yeah. Board. And they, yeah. And they both laid out, I think, a lot of the really useful, interesting uh, work that's being done there and made the point that the political uh, support for that is, has been critical. And, uh, and so I think, I think it is one of the unsung uh, uh, benefits or, or positives that's come out of the G20 process at leaders' level. Yeah, um, I agree with that. So I, I agree with that. Okay, let's, uh, let's do questions. Um, please uh, wait for the microphone. Uh, identify yourself. And uh, please do try to ask a question so we can get through as many as, as we can. I'll start right here. And I saw first. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing with us. Why have you come back from Mexico? I have two questions. Uh, I'm Ching Yi Chen with Phoenix TV. I have two questions on China. First of all, uh, China pledged to increase the fund uh, in IMF and ask for more uh, say in IMF. So what's the position of the US on this? Also, the second question is, uh, during uh, President Obama's speech the other day, he seems to imply uh, China's uh, uh, slowing uh, economic growth and issue to US recovery. So how big the concern is of China's slowing, slowing e growth economy uh, to the U.S. Thank you. Well, you know, on um, on the issue of IMF representation, it's really a very separate issue um, to the uh, fundraising drive uh, to raise uh, bilateral loans. Um, 
but uh, our position uh, has been uh, very constant. Uh, we think it is important uh, that nations' uh, economic weight is represented in their quota uh, share at the IMF. And you know, we were uh, very supportive. Uh, it was one of our uh, Pittsburgh summit announcement was that we were going to support a shift in shares from the advanced economies to emerging markets and developing economies. And it was a very tough negotiation, but we achieved it uh, in Seoul. Um, and we will continue to support um, representation uh, on the basis of uh, economic weight, uh, income, shares of the, of the global economy. Um, separate uh, to that, obviously, uh, in a world where we're seeing weaker demand uh, in Europe, uh, China and the US are more important uh, to the global economy. Uh, and China uh, has a lot of capacity, again, um, by shifting its economic model, um, it can support demand. And it's more important at a time where you see deficiencies in demand in the traditional um, areas like the US and like Europe that were the drivers uh, of growth uh, earlier um, and of export growth for countries like China. And I think we have uh, seen that theme very consistently. You know, Starting uh, in Pittsburgh, everybody signed up for a framework uh, recognizing that strong sustainable growth would need to be rebalanced growth. It also um, uh, is very well aligned with the um, uh, stated uh, goals of the Chinese uh, economic authorities who have said that they are trying to shift to domestic demand-led growth. And again, the Chinese consumer has tremendous capacity. Uh, and there are a number of reforms, for instance, in the financial sector where um, if uh, Chinese savers get greater returns and have less need for precautionary savings, they have greater purchasing power. If the exchange rate is allowed to move in response to market forces, uh, that too lifts the purchasing power of Chinese uh, consumers and helps that rebalancing. And of course, we are undertaking rebalancing in a complementary way. We had an over-leveraged economy uh, going into the crisis, over-leveraged consumers. And as they are working um, to uh, deleverage, uh, to uh, improve their balance sheets, it's very important uh, for our recovery that we be able to rebalance in the other direction with greater reliance on exports. And so those two things are very complementary to each other. And we've had a very sustained, uh, deep level of interaction, both bilaterally and again in the G20, with China, with both of us making these complementary changes to our economic growth strategies. That becomes even more important uh, in light of renewed market tensions uh, emanating from Europe. Great. OK, let me go a little further back down with the blue shirt right there. Yep. Uh, Leo, thank you very much. Lawrence McDonald, Center for Global Development. Nice to see you. Um, <clears throat> Europe's clearly very important. Uh, in your opening remarks, I was trying to think how they might have been different uh, had there been a meeting of G7 finance ministers, and I didn't come up with much difference. But we really do, as you said, have a very different kind of world. We have the G20. Uh, there are items on the G20 agenda, such as financial inclusion, development, energy, food security, that are part of your portfolio. Um, I'm imagining that those were discussed, and I'm wondering if you can tell us uh, more about those things, and in particular, if there was any U.S. leadership on these issues that affect uh, global prosperity in a, a way that looks beyond the next six to eight months. Yeah. So I think on um, the development agenda, uh, the green growth agenda, you know, the Mexicans, I think, led um, very ably, and it put a lot of emphasis on some of the key areas that we also very much support, green growth, uh, food security, uh, financial inclusion, a host of areas. On food security, obviously, um, you know, the president has really uh, led uh, very significantly there. Um, and you know, we uh, had uh, a big focus at the G8, which we carried into the G20 on the new alliance, um, which is trying to leverage private sector investments into some of the more challenging uh, markets in Africa, but the ones with the greatest potential to see big improvements in yields. You know, we announced the uh, Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, the 
it's terribly named Gatsby, <laughs> at the Pittsburgh summit. And it's been an incredible success story since then. And we've had members of the G20 uh, contributing uh, to it. The US has been a big supporter. And you know it has all the features uh, that we know from the aid effectiveness literature are so critically important. We have um, countries that are receiving grants sitting at the decision-making table with the donors and uh, with uh, the private sector. Uh, we have um, country-driven uh, strategies that are being financed and the grants being allocated on a merit-based um, a process. So that has been a, a really good success story. And again, you know, it's really the G20 that, that uh, drove that. Um, on financial inclusion, there too, you know, starting uh, in Pittsburgh, we started to develop um, a variety of uh, initiatives that went across emerging markets, developing countries, and the advanced countries. And that's an area where some of the developing economies <coughs> have a lot to offer, are farther ahead than we are. And so there's learning that's going on in both directions there. We're developing a database. We've got a specific emphasis, for instance, on women. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of uh, nice um, uh, progress there. And then on disaster risk management, where Mexico has done some pioneering work and where the US is, is very supportive as well. OK. Um, all right, gentlemen here. I was willing to go to the back. I just want to make a note of that. He's Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Michael Ignatiou from Mega TV Greece. Um, but I have an easy question, I think. Do you really believe that Greece can be saved? <laughs> 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 and the second question, after your discussions with the Europeans, are you confident that they are going to act this time? Um, so with regard to Greece, uh, obviously um, we recognize uh, that the um, challenges facing the Greek people are, are very serious and they built up over many years. And the road ahead uh, is going to be a challenging one uh, and it will require sacrifices. Um, but uh, we were very heartened um, by the formation of the new government and by the statements by the new prime minister. Um, that he feels he has a mandate to go back uh, and find a path forward uh, with Euro area partners, a uh, path that is um, continued to uh, carry forward reforms, again, which are going to be critically important to uh, making Greece uh, sustainable and, and ultimately to uh, growth. Um, and doing so within a uh, broad framework of being within the Euro area and uh, finding a path forward to sustainability. So we're encouraged by that. We're encouraged by uh, also uh, statements on the part of multiple leaders from the Euro area. But we don't underestimate the difficulty of that. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll continue to be supportive uh, on those discussions. With regard to the broader um, key areas that the Euro area uh, set out um, for its uh, forward work plan, um, financial union, uh, ensuring uh, that um, the uh, countries uh, who are reforming uh, continue to have access uh, to affordable finance, ensuring, uh, importantly, that um, there is greater support for growth. Uh, that, yes, it's important to undertake fiscal consolidation. Countries need to remain uh, committed to that. But it's also important to recognize that growth outcomes um, have been much more adverse. And so to look at fiscal consolidation paths uh, where appropriate on a structural basis, those are things that are clearly being uh, intensively uh, addressed. Uh, I, I, again, would uh, say that we can't prejudge where those conversations are going to um, uh, conclude. Um, but it's very clear that European leaders are focused on, they have a series of meetings over the next uh, period of time, and then again, uh, meeting at the end of the month on the 28th and 29th. And you know, we'll look forward to hearing from them at that juncture, um, uh, putting greater flesh on the bones of these uh, key priorities. Okay, this gentleman here. Then I'll go back. Thank you. It's actually 
Uh, my name is Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency. Actually, I have a follow-up question on IMF reform. And uh, China and other emerging uh, countries have expressed their concern that the 2010 reform plan of IMF has not uh, implemented as quick as they uh, expect. So right now, China has promised to contribute uh, 43 billion to the IMF emerging uh, fund. So will, will the United States play a key role in pushing the imp implementation of this reform to increase China's uh, voting power and bigger say? Thank you. Um, we were very supportive um, of the uh, reforms that were negotiated in Seoul. Again, I think we pushed for uh, that uh, shift in shares uh, to be included in the Pittsburgh summit. It was a major outcome, a major achievement, and then we followed through uh, in the negotiations and supported that shift in share in the actual outcome of the quota reform discussions in Seoul. So we've been, uh, I think, uh, a very strong supporter and uh, will continue to uh, support a process of governance reform within all the international institutions uh, that reflects uh, the uh, important weight of emerging markets in developing countries. Uh, I, think, I think the U.S.'s record is, is extremely strong in that area. I was in Seoul and I can confirm that uh, the Treasury worked very hard on that um, with, with, your, with our Chinese, their Chinese colleagues. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm uh, Dana Marshall, American University. Thank you, Lil, for those comments. It's a question related to the China rebalancing issue, but looking at it perhaps in a different direction. Senior officials in the, the government, Bob Hormatz, yourself and others, have talked about competitive neutrality. The World Bank, of course, a few months ago, along with a unit of the uh, Chinese government, came out with its report regarding some new approaches on Chinese economic management. At the same time, there have been a number of reports about a uh, continuing struggle uh, within China as to whether those who are advocating a continuation of the state capitalist model uh, will remain uh, with the upper hand or whether those who may be looking at a different path, maybe a more efficient path to growth. Uh, so my question is, what's Treasury's take on that uh, sort of attention? How might it come out and what are the, uh, the stakes for the United States in, that, um, in the final answer to that question? Well, the primary stakes, of course, uh, are for China. Um, you know, China has uh, experienced a very rapid growth, um, but the model uh, on which that growth uh, was based uh, is unlikely to continue to yield the same uh, pace of um, uh, growth in the future or the same uh, productivity improvements that we've seen in the past. And it's for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, there's a kind of classic middle income trap that countries uh, have experienced in a whole variety of similar contexts, and China is getting closer to that uh, level of income. Uh, it is also the case that China has very challenging demographics. So we're already, uh, in just a very few years, we'll see the uh, labor force uh, peak, and then a few years after that, um, you know, probably the limits of absorption of the agricultural labor force into uh, urban areas. Um, and so what that means, I think, but this is, of course, for, uh, for China to decide, uh, but of course we've heard um, some of uh, China's uh, economic policies reflecting this, is they have to shift to a, a, a policy uh, posture and an economic growth model that's much more uh, focused on value, higher value, greater innovation, a shift away from heavy manufacturing that's very resource intensive, very investment intensive, very export oriented to an economy that has greater and more dynamic services, uh, is more consumption oriented. Uh, and all those things, I think, go in the direction of the reforms that are important uh, both for uh, our bilateral economic relationship, the greater uh, market access and more level playing field. They also happen to be very consistent with uh, an economy that for instance, enjoys uh, more innovation because it has better intellectual property. 
um, an economy that, uh, again, is uh, got a more vibrant services sector. And we, you know, we started to see some moves in that direction of the strategic and economic dialogue. We were very pleased to see financial reform restarting after a number of years where it had really uh, stopped. Um, and with regard to the state-owned enterprises, you know, our, uh, we were very interested in the World Bank report with the DRC. We thought it was very interesting. You know, at the SNED, we talked uh, about um, addressing some of the uh, preferential treatment that state-owned enterprises have received and simply making sure um, that private enterprises and state-owned enterprises are on the same footing. And you'll see a commitment to that in this SNED for the first time. The other thing you'll see in the strategic and economic dialogue uh, document for the first time is a commitment to having state-owned enterprises paying dividends uh, in line with other um, market uh, publicly listed companies. And that's very important, too, because you know if you look at the period in which China ran these massive current account surpluses, 9%, a lot of the run-up there was uh, savings that was trapped inside state-owned enterprises. And so if they are paying out more of their earnings to social safety nets, that also will help uh, make that switch while uh, creating a, a more level playing field uh, for all private enterprises. So we think, we think that's a direction uh, that um, has a lot to recommend it. But of course, these are decisions for China to make. Great. Over here. Way in the back there. Lady with the hand up. Mm -hmm. This is Zoe Liudaki with the Greek Service of the Voice of America. You mentioned that uh, the international community needs to so show flexibility for Greece. And I'm wondering if there were any specific talks about uh, specific terms. I mean, a lot of people in Greece are really worried about deposit insurance. Were there sp uh, specific things discussed? You know, I think um, where those conversations will take place is between the Troika uh, and the representatives of the new Greek government, um, the, uh, the IMF, the ECB, uh, and um, the Commission uh, are the right uh, bodies to be sitting with the Greek government, um, the new Greek government, and working on uh, its economic stabilization uh, generally um, and uh, the reform path. Uh, and trying to get uh, Greece back on uh, a path to both reform and sustainability. But those conversations are appropriately uh, you know, held among the Troika and, and uh, representatives of the Greek government. Of course, when we were in Los Cabos, uh, we, didn't, uh, we, we were just hearing about the election results. Um, we didn't yet have a new Greek government, and that would not have been the appropriate place to have those discussions. I think uh, generally uh, there was a recognition that uh, the various parties are going to go back, uh, sit with each other, try to figure out what the best path forward is. Um, but I think it would have been premature to talk about uh, specific elements. Um, way in the back, very, very back behind you. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is uh, Jun Wei. I'm with the uh, U.S. China Foundation on uh, Economic and uh, uh, education development. So, a couple of questions. One question is: uh, This meeting is the twelfth meeting between President Obama and uh, President Hu Jintao, and also the last meeting between them. So, what the U U.S. side evaluation about the meeting and uh, under the uh, background of uh, U.S. United States election in, in, at the end of the year? So, what's the potential key area of uh, uh, conflict between U.S. China in the field of uh, uh, trade and uh, finance. Also, what's your comments on the China's current currency exchange rate? Thank you very much. So I would uh, characterize the meeting uh, between uh, President Hu and President Obama as uh, very comprehensive, touching on all aspects of the bilateral relationship and areas where we have uh, global interests. Um, I think they, as you said, this was their 12th meeting. Um, you know, they have a very uh, good uh, ability to uh, work through the issues together. Uh, there's a lot of uh, trust there. And um, of course, it's bolstered by a very uh, extensive set of contacts uh, across all the corresponding parts of both governments. And so, 
you know, that's bolstered in part by the strategic and economic dialogue, but there's a whole set of other dialogues that also undergird this very important relationship. And I think you could uh, see it reflected in the quality, the depth uh, of the discussions between uh, the two leaders. Um, you know, they also, you know, joked around a few times, um, and uh, you know, they, they they both, you know, got a lot of very specific issues done, but in a general atmosphere of recognizing that we um, we have huge important uh, mutual interests. Uh, of course, there are areas of disagreement, but we need to work through uh, very consistently uh, with a very even um, kind of tempo on both sets of issues, that it's important not just to both countries, but to the world, uh, that the US and China are able to work together. On uh, the economic issues, you know, we, again, we saw a lot of uh, important movement forward uh, in the context of uh, the visit of Xi Jinping uh, to the US, and then we saw further uh, momentum in the strategic and economic dialogue. Uh, I think, you know, in that uh, latter meeting, uh, we heard from Chinese counterparts how they intend to move forward with structural tax reform with uh, reductions in taxes on consumption imports. We're continuing to look forward to some of that because we think it'll be very important for Chinese consumption as well as, again, uh, market access issues for us. Uh, currency uh, remains a very important issue. And you know, there we have seen, both on rebalancing and on currency, important progress. You know, when the president came to office, uh, China had a current account surplus of 9% of GDP, which is huge. Uh, and that has now come down to about 3% of GDP. Um, China's uh, currency has appreciated um, bilaterally against the dollar in inflation-adjusted uh, terms by about 13%. And so that's obviously an important part of that um, rebalancing uh, process. But you know, we continue uh, to encourage um, further progress on that area. As the second largest economy in the world, it would only be natural and I think beneficial for the world economy of China really continued moving um, irreversibly to a market determined exchange rate um, and much more transparency around uh, its exchange rate regime. Okay, maybe two more, that gentleman way in the back of the white shirt. Thank you. Uh, Michael Hudson from the Atlantic Council. Uh, this afternoon, President Barroso of the EU Commission answered a question uh, with respect to the origins of the crisis, and he said European leaders were not here to receive lessons in terms of democracy or in terms of how to handle the economy. This crisis was not origina originated in Europe. This crisis originated in North America. I'd like to hear what your response would be to that statement and how prevalent that perspective has been in negotiations between the US representatives and the EU representatives. Yeah, well, I think it is important to say that the tenor of the conversations in the room is really uh, very different. Of course, um, you know, we, uh, we come to the conversations um, uh, focused on uh, our own economic uh, policies and the challenges we face here at home. Um, you know, our economic outlook and other countries come to the discussions uh, also talking about uh, their own policy stances, uh, the, um, the resilience of their own recoveries because, uh, you know, the, all of the economies represented at the table are sizable and matter for the health of the global economy and for the health of developing countries and smaller economies. Um, so I, I'd say that really is our focus in these discussions. Uh, but of course, um, you know, reflecting events, uh, there was a particular interest in hearing from Euro area colleagues uh, because of um, the challenges that our Euro area colleagues are facing. You know, and as uh, Euro area partners are moving forward, they are moving forward in a way that recognizes uh, that the institutional framework of the euro area needs to evolve in order to become more resilient, that monetary union uh, needs to be complemented by greater uh, financial union, uh, greater fiscal union, uh, some say greater political union. And so you know, the medium term uh, uh, direction there, I think, is one that couples uh, greater risk sharing, uh, but also greater sharing of responsibility. And, and that will require uh, important uh, political decisions on the part of European leaders. So 
you know, my sense is that the conversations in the room, again, very constructive, very sober, uh, very clear-eyed about the risks, uh, and uh, with all countries in the room, you know, talking about their own policy uh, responses, um, as well as interested in hearing, uh, in particular from European colleagues, uh, about uh, their plans in the days ahead. Okay, one more. Anybody? Okay, there. And then I'm going to ask one final one. Hi, I'm Katie Quinones. I'm just a measly intern with the State Department, but um, uh, in the press, <laughs> in the press uh, lately. Encourage interns to ask yeah, questions. Yeah, right. That's Every great work. person has started <laughs> right. as an intern somewhere. Well, that's good to so hear. So it's only yeah. a matter of time. Um, the press lately, or this morning today, talked a lot about the BRICS states and their role in this G20 and how they were sort of the cavalry in running and making sure um, this G20 summit was a success. And I just wanted to get your opinion on the, the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, um, India, China, and South Africa's role in this G20 20 summit and going forward. Yeah. You know, I think um, that the real focus of the discussions uh, at the G20 were around um, uh, financial market stresses. And I mean, the central preoccupation was around um, how to strengthen uh, demand, how to strengthen job creation and growth uh, as we see it uh, flagging in many parts of the world. Uh, and that, that was the central uh, focus. I think um, you know, advanced economies and emerging markets both participated in that conversation. There was interest uh, in some of the emerging markets and uh, those who have space, uh, again, to uh, rebalance uh, demand through a shift in their policy mix, um, but as well um, advanced economies. So that was the predominant focus and theme of the discussion. I think you know the IMF resources uh, commitment uh, was very welcome. It was really something that came together in the spring, uh, so that was expected. Um, and again, welcome, uh, but the critically important thing uh, really uh, is not um, is not sitting with the IMF, it's really sitting um, with Europe as it navigates a path forward uh, that is resilient uh, and that strengthens um, the vibrancy of, of Europe, uh, again, a uh, critically important partner to us, but also very important uh, to many other countries in the room. Great, thank you. So let me just ask about um, sort of what happens next. So this is a bit of an unusual year because the Mexicans moved up their, uh, their summit to June. Uh, normally it's in November, so they, as I understand it, continue to have the presidency until end of November, end of October. I think that's you know, sometime I think in the that's fall. right. And then Russia takes over for for the next year. Um, do the Me Mexicans have plans for further meetings or further activity um, in their host year? And do we have any sense of what the Russians want to do, or is it too early to, to determine? I think um, we know that uh, there'll be another, uh, I believe, um, G20 ministerial uh, sometime in the fall, uh, hosted by uh, the Mexicans. Uh, so, you know, on the finance you mean track. Other than the, the Tokyo IMF I, be I believe so. Uh, so, you know, the finance track, uh, the finance ministers and central bank governors meet more frequently, and that, that is as it should be. Um, uh, so that's the plans that I know in the area that we are uh, most engaged in. But you know, there were a whole host of activities that the Mexicans had been sponsoring in terms of workshops and areas like financial inclusion and uh, disaster risk management in developing countries, green growth. I think those activities will continue. And you have to remember, and you know this because you participate in it, there is a, a for every major substantive area, there's an underlying working group um, that stays in close contact with each other through phone calls, conference calls, meetings. And so that activity will continue, I think, uh, at a you know, sort of uh, high pace over the course of the year. And then, of course, as you said, um, Russia assumes the G20 presidency for the next year. Uh, I, I have not yet gotten a formal um, uh, kind of look ahead uh, from the Russians in terms of what themes they want to emphasize uh, for next year. But of course, we're very much looking forward to working uh, with our Russian colleagues, first as they host the uh, APEC summit, and then as they take over the presidency of the G20. Great. Excellent. Well, this was really a terrific sort of whirlwind uh, tour of, a, of a, a very large, complicated set of issues. And we really uh, appreciate your, your spending the time with us. And 
I learned something and I hope others did. And uh, we, we hope you can come back. And uh, there were a lot of issues there that I'd like to have other sessions on, like China and the SNED and other things. And we'll, uh, we'll be back in touch. Great. But thank you thank very you. much, everyone. Thank I you. Hope you can join me.